These two little girls here have never been found, and their parents have no idea what happened to their daughters. This suspect has been on the run for over 40 years, but in 10 seconds, he's gonna sense panic for the first time. What we have here is your actual statement that you gave to the police. Okay. He started to read it. You could tell he was turning to get nervous. <sighs> oh, they got me. Oh, they got me. Four decades earlier, Sheila and Catherine Lyon disappeared in Wheaton, Maryland, and never came back. The two sisters were walking just a half mile from their home to Wheaton Plaza Mall. Back in those days when parents were more casual about those things, the mother told them to be home by 4 p.m. They did not return. No bodies, no arrests. The trail went cold. Now, over 40 years later, with newly discovered evidence, detectives believe this man knows what happened to Lyon's sisters. We got you. The day they were abducted, we know a lot. And we know you still know a lot. But what the detectives don't know, not only would they solve the case of Lion Sisters, but also discover a series of similar child committed crimes by his family, finally putting an end to their reign of terror. What was in the bag, Henry? Could have been the kids in the bag. Oh, Patsy, your husband had all with me. That would have been the right thing you should have done. That was nine years old. <laughs> I know I'm going to hell. <laughs> The year is 1975. Ten-year-old Catherine and 12-year-old Sheila Lyon live a happy and carefree life. It's the second day of school spring vacation, and the sisters plan to visit Wheaton Plaza Center to meet their friends. Upon hearing their plan for today, their mother, Mary, gives each daughter money for pizza and tells them to return home by 4 p.m. With that, the sisters leave the house. Hours later, at 4 p.m., their curfew is over, but they still haven't come back and Mary feels a bit frustrated. By 7 p.m., frustration turns into fear, and Mary decides to call the police to inform them about the missing girls. A frantic search ensues, and Lyon's family launches a non-stop watch, ensuring someone is always by the phone, ready for any news. The police quickly established the sisters were taken away against their will. Well, 10-year-old Catherine and 12-year-old Sheila were last seen, police believe, walking home. They comb through neighborhoods, grill witnesses, and chase down leads from the public. Search teams, aided by trained dogs, scour the area around the shopping center and the lion home. The dogs pick up a scent trail leading from the mall to a nearby parking lot, but it goes cold there. Divers plunge into lakes, ponds, and even storm drains. Civilian volunteers join the hunt, but despite all efforts, the girls are not found. Soon, a reward of $9,000 is offered for any information leading to their safe return. With both of the sisters missing, investigators think there could be more than one person behind their disappearance. Also, they believe the motive could be sexual. Quickly, they start questioning known sex offenders in the area, but none of them seem to be involved as their alibis are checked out. Initially, suspicions fall on the girl's father, John. However, he is soon dismissed as a suspect. In the meantime, Mary and John feel devastated and panicked but they manage to maintain a composed facade in public. They're accustomed to being in the spotlight because of their jobs and understand the significance of publicity in locating the missing girls. The local newspapers splash the story of the missing girls on their front pages. Over 300 concerned citizens dial emergency lines, flooding the police with tips. Every patch of land, every wooded area, and every abandoned building undergo thorough searches. The hunt extends to muddy ponds, and the serene lake adjacent to Kensington Nursing Home. Every resident and staff member at the nursing home undergoes interviews, yet the search yields no clues, and everyone seems clueless. On April 4th, 1975, an ominous call shattered their hopes. An anonymous voice demands $10,000 to be left in an Annapolis courthouse restroom. With police backing, John Lyon complies, leaving $101 inside the designated briefcase but the ransom remains untouched. The caller, citing police presence, retreats, leaving the Lyon family in despair. John, resolute, insists on hearing his daughter's voices before proceeding. The anonymous man doesn't call ever again. In the following weeks, various witnesses call the police to assist in the search of the sisters. So in 1975, Many people that were in the mall that day saw a male with a tape recorder who was tape recording kids. According to the witness, 
The Lion Sisters and other kids nearby spoke into the microphone the man was holding, thinking their voices would be on the radio. This description of the man with the briefcase makes authorities see him as the main suspect in the case. They nickname him Tape Recorder Man. Subsequently, just before the sisters vanished from the shopping center, a slightly older girl named Danette Shea, a friend of theirs, had also seen a suspicious, unknown individual. I was shopping at Wheaton Plaza, and there was this man in front of the door of a women's clothing store. And then he gave us the meanest-looking face. And I'm looking, and I'm wondering, what's he watching? And I see Sheila and another girl that was younger, and I figured that must be her younger sister. He was interested in her big time. The police create a sketch based on Shay's description. A white guy in his late teens or early 20s, about 5 feet 11 inches tall, with acne and scars on his left cheek, wearing shabby clothes and a light-colored Peter's jacket. This young suspect is totally different from the older suspect originally identified. Not just in looks, but also in age and behavior. However, this sketch of the young suspect isn't shared widely, as investigators are more focused on finding the middle-aged man with the tape recorder, whom multiple witnesses have seen around the shopping center on the day the sisters disappeared. Still, the police keep an eye out for any leads based on the descriptions from the public. April 1st, 1975, six days after abduction, an 18-year-old named Lloyd Lee Welch heads to the same shopping center where the Lion sisters were last seen with a specific mission in mind, to alert a security guard about a suspicious man he saw on March 25th. What we have here is your actual statement that you gave to the police. Okay, right. I don't remember this. I, I swear, I can't remember. He's saying anything about a mall. Meeting Plaza. When Lloyd was caught lying, he agreed to make a statement again. We were at the mall that day, and I did see him in there in a suit with a briefcase. And he was talking to some girl. And he had them two girls with him. He was putting them in the car. And I told him, and I said, man, something just ain't right. I did go back to the mall, and I did make that statement. In order to verify his claims, Welch submits to a polygraph test. But shockingly, it indicates he's lying. Lloyd even lies about his age, claiming he's 22 years old. He insisted he went to the plaza with his wife Helen on March 29th, even though he wasn't married to her at all. He then confesses to fabricating the entire story about the car and spotting the man and girls outside. Lloyd did the same thing back in 1975. He lied in his statement, but officers in 1975 made a big mistake. Consequently, the detectives dismiss Lloyd as an attention seeker with no valuable information. As Lloyd exits the police station, he receives a stern lecture from the officers regarding his false reports. They view him as a complete waste of their time, especially since he appears to be under the influence. They speculate that his motivation might be solely driven by the reward offered by WMAL, where John Lyon worked. Naturally, they're irritated by his presence and find him rather foolish, though not necessarily suspicious. It doesn't add up for someone to draw attention to themselves if they were truly involved in the kidnapping. On the transcript of Welch's statement now stands a single-page report, boldly marked with the words, Polygraph Lied. April 6th, two weeks after the sister's disappearance. An 11-year-old boy named William Krebs spots the sisters in a white two-door Pontiac sedan cruising along U.S. Route 211 in Centerville, Virginia. There was a sighting in 1975. A tip was called in of two girls in a station wagon in the back with a blanket over, kind of cover them, and they thought it was weird. The next day, a witness in Manassas, Virginia, reports seeing two girls resembling the Lion Sisters in the back of a beige 1968 Ford station wagon around 7.30 p.m. on the day they vanished. This witness claims the children were bound and gagged. The driver of the station wagon had a striking resemblance to the middle-aged man depicted in the composite sketch. When the driver realized he was being followed, he accelerated through a red light toward Interstate 66, initially deemed credible. An eyewitness report sparks a frenzy in the media. However, the police later labels it questionable. Despite this setback, the report motivates a group of citizen band radio users to join forces and search the area where the sighting occurred. Unfortunately, 
Their amateur efforts don't lead to any breakthroughs, as attempts to find matching plate numbers fail. Contemporary press accounts reveal that a man resembling the sketch of the middle-aged individual seen at the shopping center approached several young girls weeks before the Lion sisters' disappearance. He asked them to recite an answering machine message from an index card into his handheld microphone. These unsettling incidents occurred at Marlow Heights Shopping Center and Iverson Mall in neighboring Prince George's County. Despite extensive media coverage and ongoing press interest, no substantial leads emerge regarding the girl's whereabouts. May 23rd, Maryland. Lieutenant Governor Blair Lee deploys 122 National Guardsmen to search a Montgomery County forest for the missing girls, yet their efforts give no results. Even with relentless searching, the Lion sisters' disappearance fades into a mystery. Their parents and older brother appreciate the police's work, but by the summer of 75, they accept the grim reality that the girls are probably gone. However, cops keep probing, especially focusing on the person spotted with the tape recorder. Over the next three decades, a handful of clues surface, yet none lead detectives any closer to cracking the case. And the case goes cold. In 2013, Many original Lion case investigators have retired or passed away by now, leaving little progress. One night, I just realized that I was done and I was getting ready to put all the files away. And I stumbled upon this statement that I had never seen before, which was weird because I knew every piece of paper in the 20 boxes that was the Lion sisters case file. And I've never seen this statement before. To this day, I don't know how that got there. He found this six-page statement from then-teenage Lloyd Welsh to the Montgomery County Police saying that he had witnessed the girls being led from the mall. A decision is made to re-examine archived case records. Lloyd Lee Welch Jr., as we're doing a computer background, to find him, we realized, uh-oh, not only does he have a criminal history, he's got offenses against children. Big red flags, huge. Critically, he notices a mugshot taken in 1977 matches the 1975 composite drawing of a man seen at the Wheaton Plaza shopping center before the girl's abduction. That's me. That's you. That was a drawing that was made. His mugshot from 77 compared to the composite, it was almost identical. October 16th, 2013. The interview is conducted with Welch and lasts for eight hours. At first, investigators worry Welch will not talk to them. But during the initial interview, Welch surprises everyone. He starts by saying, I know why you're here. You're here about those two missing kids. These two old girls here have never been found. And their parents are damn near 80 years old. They have no idea what happened to their daughters. That's why we're here to talk to you. During this talk, Welch admits to seeing the sisters near the shopping center on the day they disappeared. When shown a photo of Raymond Molesky Sr., a known child sex trafficker, Welch insists he's the one he saw taking the Lion Sisters. The detective's primary goal was to get Lloyd to identify Ray Molesky as the person who had taken the girls from the mall. So the picture taken back from that time period, if that guy means anything to you, that's the guy right there. However, in the second interview, Welch now admits to observing the Lion Sisters as they were leaving the shopping center. He also admits that he knew Molesky and that Molesky took both of the girls to their home, gave them a pill, and did horrible things as they were unconscious. I get ready to go in and I always I go in, I got scared. I knew that was the girls who picked up the ball. They drove up beat each other, drove up because we're laying there like that. When I heard the scream, I just woke in. I knew it was two males. They were screwing the girls. See, that's why I got scared of Brad. Can't tell you anymore. The detectives are now getting closer and closer to uncovering what really happened to Lion Sisters. But there's one problem. Molesky died three years ago in prison, and the detectives doubt the truthfulness of Welch's answers. In subsequent interviews with investigators, Welch now denies Molesky's culpability in the sisters' abduction and murder. He contradicts several claims given in his initial interrogation in the 12 subsequent interviews granted to investigators. I don't want to die in prison. I really don't, you know. Not how I know if it's true or not. You know what I mean? <laughs> the first thing that would go through somebody, is he involved in it? Right. No, I'm not involved. I've never killed anybody. I've never kidnapped anybody. And I never ever would. Right. 
Welch alternates between denying involvement in the sister's kidnapping and murder, claiming knowledge of relatives' culpability while maintaining his own innocence, and admitting to only planning and commissioning the kidnapping. Let's just cut all the out. You failed that polygraph because there's something that you're not telling the truth about, period. I don't know what happened to those girls and I don't know where they're at. Can we clarify the last time when Dave talked to you and you said that you saw him at that house naked in the basement? I see two girls at a home. That was true. Welch is constantly changing accounts of who he saw abducting and taking advantage of the sisters, his alternating stories about his participation, his failure of a polygraph test in one of the first interviews granted to investigators, and the fact that his changing accounts and admissions resulted from being disproven or challenged, led investigators to quickly see Welch as a participant in the crime rather than a witness. Furthermore, Welch inadvertently reveals details about the crime that are gradually proven to be known only to a direct participant. February 2014 The investigators officially name Lloyd Welch as a person of interest in the Lion Sisters case. Detectives now uncover that at the time of the abduction, Welch was an 18-year-old living with his family, whose members often participated in incest. Lloyd was also sexually assaulted as a little kid by his father. July 2014, two months later. One of the questions that Dave asked Lloyd was to theorize what happened to the girls after Ray Molesky abducted them. What do you think he did to the girls? Personally? Yeah, I'm asking your opinion. Well, my opinion is that he killed them. He raped them, he killed them, probably burned them, I don't know. Welch now admits that the day after they vanished, he witnessed his father, Lloyd Welch Sr., and uncle, Richard Allen Welch, taking advantage of one of the girls in a dark, concrete basement. Initially, Welch says the basement was at his uncle's place, but later confesses it was actually at his father's home in Hyattsville, Maryland. Welch now claims his father and uncle threatened him, forcing him to abandon the girls to their fate in this location. He says he never saw the girls alive again and was coerced into helping destroy all evidence of the crime at the property when he learned of their murders. It's now September 2014. Investigators are on a hunt. They're searching Taylor's Mountain and Welch's uncle's place in Hyattsville. The rooms they find match Welch's description perfectly, and they're seizing items left and right in their search. The tension is high as they dig deeper into this horrifying story. Police and investigators, with the FBI's evidence recovery team, conduct a forensic search on Taylor's Mountain. They discover various small degraded bone fragments of human origin, a lone human tooth, a section of charred wire, possibly from Sheila Lyons' glasses, and remnants of a beaded necklace or bracelet similar to one Catherine often wore. These items are found exactly where neighbors of the Welch family recall the 1975 fire occurring. In December 2014, detectives received crucial information from Welch's cousin, Henry Parker. I ain't seen no bodies of nothing. She said, babe! The green knuckle bag that was full of bloody sheets and bodies and stunk. For God's sakes, Henry, I did not have you. I have not met him no. What was in the bag, Henry? I don't, I don't, I don't know. No, 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 I don't know what was in the bag. You're going to get a pass one way or the other. It's either a pass to jail or a pass to walk out of here. It could have been them kids in the bag. What were you told was in the bag? He said it's a dead dog. He shows up there with a bag with bloody clothes, and you're going to believe it's a dead dog? I didn't look at it. It over in the fire. Without asking questions, Parker tossed the bags into a fire that burned for days, leaving behind a foul smell that neighbors later recalled as reminiscent of burnt flesh. At the time, no one suspected foul play, as burning trash in the area was common. Corroborating parts of Parker's story, his sister, Connie Akers, adds her own account. It was an army green duffel bag. It's a full. Big enough that you could put one of these girls in? Sure. May 2015. A forensic examination of the basement rear room at Welch's father's house uncovers a chilling discovery. Extensive blood traces cover the concrete floor, hinting at a grim past. DNA testing confirms human blood, but its degraded state can't be taken for further analysis. These findings lead to charges against Welch for the murders. Investigators also tag Richard Allen Welch as a person of interest. Months after authorities searched Welch's father's home, 
after forensic evidence supported his altered version of events, and after confronting family testimony regarding a bonfire on Taylor's Mountain, Welch adjusts his statements. He now reveals a shocking secret about the sisters' abduction, abuse, and murder. Lloyd was saying the motive for the abduction was this pornography stuff that Dick was into. He was in a porn and he wanted to make movies to make money. I saw Dickie having sex. Lee was in the basement and he had a camera. These girls were to be party with him, and I was the sucker to get them. Welch is now facing two first-degree murder charges in connection with the Lion sisters' disappearance. He admits to abducting them and intending to assault them with his uncle. The girls were sexually assaulted and murdered to cover up their captors' crimes, as revealed by Bedford County Sheriff Michael Brown in a press conference. September 12, 2017. Welch agrees to a plea bargain, in which he will admit his involvement in the girls' kidnapping at the trial. This plea bargain finds him guilty of two counts of first-degree murder. Despite his denial of directly causing the girls' deaths, he's held responsible because the sisters perished during the abductions with the sinister intent to defile. But when it comes time for the trial, Welch refuses to speak and doesn't confess to anything at all. However, even without confessing, Welch receives two 48-year sentences for two counts of murder. At the moment, Welch continues serving his sentence in prison in Delaware. The whereabouts of the Lion Sisters still remain a mystery to this day. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notifications, and leave a like to help the channel. Thank you for watching.